from Psalm 116, verses 5 through 7. The Word says, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, He saved me. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of His Holy Word. This morning we are here and we are listening to worship God and give Him glory and honor. And we need to repent of our sins and we need to be humble before our God. Would you pray a prayer with me, please? Would you lift up your hearts and your voices and let us go to the Lord in prayer together, giving Him glory and praying for the service. Right now, in the name of Jesus, let us pray. Father in heaven, mighty God, we know that you are God Almighty and there is no other. You are holy and righteous and we have sinned, Lord. We have rebelled and we are a sinful people. Please have mercy on us, Lord. Please forgive us. We know who Jesus is. He is the Christ, your Son of God. Yes, Lord, the Lamb of God who died for us on the cross. And yet, Lord, you are raised in the power of the Holy Spirit. And your Spirit is with us. Lead us and guide us, Lord, for your glory. May we humble ourselves and may we be acceptable to you, Lord. Please, Lord, we humbly pray. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I lift up every soul, every family, Lord, that this church represents and everyone who hears this service. Would you be with them, Lord? Would you protect them from the world? Would you help us, Lord, as we worship to put away the world, to empty ourselves and give this time to you? We know we're weak. We know we can't do it on our own. That's why, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. We ask, Lord, that what we do and say, may it be pleasing to you. May we draw near to you. Because you are a good God, the one and only God, holy and righteous, and you are our God. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come thy fount of every blessing. I come thy fount of every blessing. I do my heart to sing thy praise. I sing thy praise. Never cease. All for songs of loud and praise. A peaceful summer, oh, the sun is rising on the plains of the world. Praise the mountains and rivers of God, and the God comes in love. Here I lay my everlasting in the eyes of heaven above. And I could praise Him, praise the King of life and hope. And Jesus taught me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, intercourse His precious blood. For to pray, have prayed again. Come with praise. 
오늘 저희들에게 주신 하나님의 말씀입니다. 미가서 6장 1절에서 8절입니다. 너희는 여호와의 말씀을 들을지어다. 너는 일어나서 산을 향하여 변론하여 작은 산들이 네 목소리를 듣게 하라 하셨나니 너희 산들과 땅의 견고한 지대들아 너희는 여호와의 변론을 들으라. 여호와께서 자기 백성과 변론하시며 이스라엘과 변론하실 것이라. 이르시기를 내 백성아 내가 무엇을 네게 행하였으며 무슨 일로 너를 괴롭게 하였느냐 너는 내, 내게 증언하라 내가 너를 애굽땅에서 인도해내어 종로로 타는 집에서 송량하였고 모세와 아론과 미리암을 내 앞에 보냈느니라 내 백성아 너는 모압 왕 발락이 꾀한 것과 보월의 아들 발람이 그에게 대답한 것을 기억하며 시뜸에서부터 길갈까지의 일을 기억하라 그리하면 나 여호와가 공의롭게 행한 일을 알리라 하실 것이니라 내가 무엇을 가지고 여호와 앞에 나아가며 높으신 하나님께 경배할까 내가 번제물로 일련된 송아지를 가지고 그 앞에 나아갈까 여호와께서 천천의 순양이나 만만의 강물같이 기름을 기뻐하실까 내 허물을 위하여 내 맏아들을 내 영혼의 죄로 말미암아 내 몸의 열매를 드릴까 사람아 주께서 선한 것이 무엇임을 내게 보이셨나니 여호와께서 네게, 네게 구한 구하시는 것은 오직 정의를 행하며 인자를 사랑하며 겸손하게 네 하나님과 함께 행하는 것이 아니냐. 아멘. Micah chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, 
you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Father, thank you. Thank you for this, your holy word. Thank you, Lord, for this message and these people who are here and those who hear it, Lord, wherever they may be. Lord, bless them with wisdom and eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for them this day. And Lord, may you and only you receive the glory as we draw near to you. And your perfect will be done, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. God requires. This morning, I want to consider what the prophet Micah understood to be God's requirements. Now, Micah is a prophet of God. If he knows what God requires, we should listen. It says at the beginning, listen to what God says. Listen to what he says. This is what he requires. If there is a verse in this chapter, in this book, to memorize, to remember from Micah, then it is verse 8 of our text. Verse 8, it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. It's good to know this verse so that God might write those requirements in our hearts. If God requires this, if this is what God wants from us, then we should know what it is, shouldn't we? So please, I ask you this morning to repeat after me. Please say these words. Act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Let us say it one more time. Act justly, and walk, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Hmm. I'd really like y'all to say that as I say it, not after I say it. Now, I like to make this, when I say this, a little bit more personal. By saying it this way, I say it this way. Act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with my God. My God. You see, that makes it more personal. Why? Because God is my God. Is he your God? I hope and pray that he is. If he is, then you should say it like me, right? So let's try that. Please repeat with me, would you please? Act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with my God. Now, I never heard a single one of you say that with me. <laughs> I'm saying it too fast. Okay, let's try it one more time. Act justly 
and love mercy and walk humbly with my God. Now, hopefully some of you are so smart that you're able to have it memorized already. That it's so easy for you and you already know that you could say it without looking or without me telling you, right? Do you think you could? I know some of you could because it's fairly simple. Act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with my God. Very simple thing. It really sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Do justice. Love mercy and walk humbly with my God. It almost sounds like an oath, doesn't it? Y'all all know the scouting oath? If any of y'all been Boy Scouts, you know what I'm talking about. It says, they said what? Be fair, be nice, and be humble. Those are three things that the scouts used to say. They used to say, be fair, be nice, and be humble. But when you study the prophet here, when you look at who he is and what's going on and the situation, these, when, you, when you understand the context in which he said them and their impact on the people who heard them, then you realize that it's much more than just a shallow oath or motto that people say. It's much deeper than a memorized verse of Scripture, even though I hope you memorize it because if you memorize it, maybe it'll get into your heart. If most of us are honest, though, I don't think many of us remember much from the prophet Micah, do we? In fact, a lot of us even forget that Micah's a prophet. You know, we, we remember other prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, but Micah? Not, not many of us really remember him, do we? But to understand Micah a little better, we must place him in the context of the history of the Hebrew people. Through, though Abraham is thought as the father of the Hebrew nation, the Hebrew people, the one that, that God gave most of promises to so much and taught to people was, really it began with Moses, right? It's Moses is who God used. The Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt and making bricks and starving and being beaten and, and they were calling out to God. When God called Moses to the top of the mountain, he spoke to him from a, a burning bush. Now, you, much of this you remember and you know, and, and God sent Moses to Pharaoh with one message. Let my people go. Let my people go. And you know the rest of the story. God, through Moses' leadership, led the people out of bondage to the promised land. And God himself established a covenant. This is very important. A covenant with the Hebrew people. I'm going to paraphrase it. He says, I will be your God and you will be my people. God's loving actions of freeing the Hebrew people from slavery and giving them the promised land were only the first ways that God held up his end of the deal. He held up his end of the deal. God promised to continue to provide for them, and he did. He put, kept all of his promises, all of them. But a covenant relationship is a two-way street. There's two sides of the coin. Both parties in a covenant have responsibilities and requirements and require behaviors that sustain and maintain the relationship. That's what a covenant is. It, it's just like a marriage covenant. Y'all know what a marriage covenant is, where two people uh, promise to love each other and care for each other. And most of you remember that promise, as you know, is to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. 
But most of y'all know those. You've heard them. You've probably even recited them. You've probably even said them. Although society has thrown out those promises, most of you here agree to the requirements of a marriage covenant because we love somebody and we want to commit our lives to them. Amen? If you didn't want to do that, why did you get married in the first place? In fact, I tell you, if you're not willing to commit yourself through all of those things, health, sickness, poor, well, bad, good, if you're not willing to do that, don't get married. Let's be honest. God made such a covenant as that with the Hebrew people. He says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And what God requires of the Hebrew people, God made promises. We know what he said he would do. What does he want the Hebrews to do? I would summarize them this way. He says, love me and yourselves and others like I have loved you. That summarizes basically what God says. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in Leviticus 19, 18, he says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And God added a few specifics like don't murder, don't lie, don't steal, be faithful to your husband or your wife, don't be jealous of your neighbors of what they have, don't want what they have, don't covet that. And these are pretty obvious requirements for good relationships, wouldn't you think? For to have good relationships, these are, these are simple. These are good requirements. And God, really, he added a lot of reminders. He continued to remind his people many, many times. He, he reminded uh, of them this covenant. And I would like to read just a few of them, so bear with me. First, we have Deuteronomy 4. Verses 23 and 24, if you're writing that down, it's a good thing you can go back and read it later. Deuteronomy 4, 23 24 says, Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Then in Deuteronomy 6, 10 and 12 through 12 says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities. You did not build houses filled with all kinds of good things. You did not provide wells you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. One more, please. One more. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 through 2 says, Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know that what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Now, there's many, many more, but I think you should have the point by now that God reminded his people and what he was telling them, don't forget, God said, when you get to the promised land and begin to enjoy a life of freedom, when you have an abundance of everything you need in that land, don't forget me and our relationship and the things that you need to do 
to remain in the right relationship with me. In other words, when you're safe and free and fat and happy, remember me. That's what God said. Because he knows you're going to get comfortable. Fat and happy and lazy. and you're going to be the perfect calf for the sacrifice. Don't forget God. God knew. God knew that the Hebrew people would again and again and again forget their covenant. God kept his side, but people struggled, especially the Hebrews. Micah preached during one of these periods of history when the Hebrew people, things were going well for them. They had forgotten their covenant. Things were so good that they forgot God, that they forgot their covenant, the one who delivered them from slavery. Things were going well. The nation was economically well off. They were politically well off. They had no enemies. They weren't fighting. Everything was great. They were happy. They were fat, dumb, and happy, basically. Micah condemned the leaders of the people for their injustices, acted against the poor and the powerless people. They were mistreating the poor and the powerless. Micah condemned the leaders of his people for complacency, and they pretended like nothing was wrong, and they abused the power that they had. Both political and religious leaders, too, were doing the same thing. They weren't taking care of God's people. They weren't providing justice. They weren't loving mercy. They weren't walking with God. When Micah confronts the leaders of the nation with these injustices, their response basically was to change the subject. You know what they said? They said, hey, wait a minute. We're good Jews. We, 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 we go to the temple every Sabbath, and we offer sacrifices, and we give lots of, we give generously to the temple coffers, and we give tithes. Uh, what does God expect from us anyway? We do all that. That's what they were going ask saying, and that's why God says back. And that's the question that Micah answers here in our text today. What does God require of you? Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's what he said. So what are we thinking about justice? What does justice mean in this context? The word justice means fairness. Be fair. Fair play. Uh, equity. Everybody's equal within the human family. We're all humans. We're all sinners. We all make mistakes. We all are what we are. Right? To do justice involves the, the basic needs or requirements, even rights of people who live together in a community. Justice is decidedly a social, it's actually social in nature, justice. The practice of justice, either by God or by the people, would be to rectify the inequity of a society that allow people to be oppressed to the point to where they are deprived of the basic needs. They are deprived of their rights that would allow them to function as part of the community. Now, what I'm saying is we deny them the ability to even work for it. We deny them a chance to lift themselves up. They deny, they're denied justice. God's covenant requires the people from God that are delivered from slavery never to treat others like they had been treated in Egypt. They've been treated terribly in Egypt, and God says, you will not treat anybody like that. 
To do so would be a, a violation of the very promise that God made to the Hebrew people. Doing justice would involve both personal and social responsibilities. We wouldn't treat people poorly if we were practicing justice. It would compel one never to act in ways that might produce injustice. God demands that the Hebrew people take responsibility for their personal behavior and also their political leader's behavior. You say, well, how do I do that? Be responsible. Be a citizen and act justly. God requires that we work for fairness for the little people of our world. God requires a commitment to the poor, to the oppressed, and to the powerless in our society. God demands it. What does the God of heaven require of us? Act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Number two, love mercy. What does love mercy mean in the context of this message? This is the Hebrew term, which is hesed. Hesed, which is a meaning that's sort of hard to capture in English in just one word. It's hard because it has such a deep meaning. It's been translated many ways in God's word, kindness and mercy, but no one English word can express its meaning. It may be a covenant, a covenant faithfulness or a covenant compassion or, or a loyal love or loving devotion and steadfast love or just attempts to translate this word, this term. It's often used to describe God's faithful actions throughout history on behalf of God's people. God does that towards his people. God's people are expected to respond to God with a steadfast loyalty and a steadfast love that reflects the compassion and grace that God has given to us. He expects us to treat people like he treats us. We don't do too good a job of that. You see, hesed then is a relationship term. It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling kind of love. It's not that. But it's a commitment. A commitment and a steadfast dependability that arises from a mutual, caring relationship. To love mercy is to be committed not only to God, who uh, demonstrated his love to the people, it's also to live his love in a community in such a way that mercy marks the life of God's people when they live together. In other words, they're committed to a good relationship with each other. That's what God wants us to be and to do and to act. <sighs> to love mercy, we, we have to have a uh, uh, committed to a quality of life that's really governed by the principles of mutual respect and love helpfulness and loving concern. We must demonstrate mercy to each other. So what does the Lord require of you? What does he require of us? Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Hope you have that memorized by now. Well, let's talk about walking humbly. What did Micah mean when he said, walk humbly with your God? You know, walking a path 
is a pretty common biblical metaphor uh, for living a certain kind of life. Y'all have heard walking as God walks and walking with Jesus. Y'all, y'all pretty much understand that metaphor, right? Walking humbly with God is a call to do more than to come to God with offerings or thinking that you can maybe work or, or you can do something, deeds, or you can pay your way to have a good uh, relationship with God or if you give more than everybody else, then guess what? I get God's favor if I go to church more than anybody else and God owes me. It's not that. It's a call to live our lives with God in a way that would work out in every aspect of our life. We walk with God and we live with Him and everything we do, we work with the relationship that God has with us. It implies we have the same heart as God. When you walk humbly with your God, that means you have the same heart as God. It's a deep desire to see the world through the eyes of God, to act in the world like God would act, do what Jesus would do. Put yourselves away and be filled with God. When this final requirement, if you take that final requirement, walking humbly with your God, When you take that and you put it alongside the other two, acting justly and loving mercy, when you put those together, God means you have a heart for justice and compassion. You can't, in fact, in this sequence here, walking with God is actually the overarching category for doing what? For doing justice and love because you can't walk with God unless you're doing justice and love do y'all see that it's sort of overarching it's not a separate requirement it's an umbrella of the other two act justly and love mercy then you can walk with God. That's how you walk with God. Don't try to separate it. They cannot be separated. So what does the Lord God require of us? Y'all got it by now. Surely, act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Can you remember that? In conclusion, the God, the very God that we worship, the God who led the the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land, he requires a people who have been so blessed by him that they must be a blessing to others. To walk with God, that means to live a steadfast love for others, especially those whom Jesus called, do y'all remember what he said? The least of these. Those are the words of Jesus. The least of these. When we understand the message of the prophet Micah, we realize Jesus didn't make this thing up. He didn't make very much up. He is God, and it's his words. Right out of the words that he fulfilled. He, he stood in a long line of, of Hebrew prophets who, who called their people to walk humbly with their God. Lots of prophets had said, walk humbly with God. What does the Lord require of us? What does he require of us? Act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. That's what he requires. Can you do that? If Micah was here today, I think he would ask us if we have forgotten our covenant with God. Have we forgotten? 
I think Micah might say to us Christians, you've been delivered. You've been delivered from slavery, and you are in the promised land, and you have a hope that's only in him. You enjoy a life of freedom and the abundance of that land. Every single one of us does. But you have forgotten your God. You have forgotten your relationship with God and the things you need to do to maintain that relationship. God says, when you are free and safe and fat and happy, remember me. Jesus said it this way. In John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What does the Lord require of us? Please say it with me. Act justly. Love mercy. And walk with my God. I hope that that's in your hearts. Not just words from your lips. Not words from your mouth. But really in your heart. That's what it needs to be. Memorize it. Say it so much that when you forget God, it comes to mind, you say, wait a minute, this is what God requires me to do. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us, Lord, because we too, we too go astray and we forget our covenant, Lord. We, we forget the covenant that you have made to us, Lord. And you require, Lord, you require us very obviously, Lord, to, to be just, to love justice. And to love mercy, Lord, and to be merciful like you are merciful to us. And to walk with you, humbly with you as our God. And we fail. Such a simple thing. It's not hard. It's hard to live it. It's easy to know what you require. Lord, be with us. Have mercy on us and forgive us where we have failed you. And Lord, we just put ourselves at the foot of Jesus and we ask that you would cover us with the blood of Jesus. Lord, help us all right now, every single one of us, to admit that we are sinners. And we can't, Lord, take away our sin. And help us, Lord, to say we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He died for my sins. Help us, Lord, to say it from our heart and to mean it, Lord, and to walk with you, Lord, in this life so, Lord, that our hope to see you face to face one day will, Lord, it will be deep in our souls. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us. You are God Almighty, and we thank you for being the loving God that you are. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Let's all stand.